About eight days after saying this, he climbed the mountain to pray, taking Peter, John, and James along. And while Jesus was in prayer, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became blinding white. At once, two men were talking with him and they turned out to be Moses and Elijah. And what a glorious appearance they made. They talked over his exodus, the one Jesus was about to complete in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Peter and those with him were, were slumped over in sleep. And when they came to, rubbing their eyes, they saw Jesus in his glory and the two men standing with him. When Moses and Elijah had left, Peter said to Jesus, Master, this is a great moment. Let's build three memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He blurted this out without thinking. While he was babbling on like this, a light radiant cloud enveloped them. And as they found themselves buried in the cloud, they became deeply aware of God. Then there was a voice out of the cloud, This is my son, the chosen. Listen to him. And when the sound of the voice died away, they saw Jesus there alone. They were speechless. And they continued speechless, said not one thing to anyone during those days of what they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. So where do you go for perspective? You got any high places? Oh, the kids, children. We got, they got high places to go right now, like to Sunday school. Children, it's time to head off. Those of you who head off to Sunday school, have fun with your lessons. God's blessings and you, as you head to your mountaintop experience. And you can go right there. And we'll see you after the service. And for perspective, where do you go? A lot of people have gone to high places. And you know, it's, it's one of the common things in human experience that when people want to have some sort of vision or see life differently, they try to get up and, and uh, see all the space that lay before them. These days, we have things like the Hubble. And you can get up and not only get a cosmic view of your surroundings, but a cosmic view of the universe. It's quite remarkable. Or you can get up in an in a airplane and you can literally see the curvature of the earth when you're up in an airplane. I always like noticing that, that you can just see the fact that the earth is shaped like a globe. Just like when you're on the edge of the ocean, you get just a little bit of sense. And you can see that because you see the sails of boats and high things first come into view first and you realize what we're on. We're on this amazing sphere. John Verone shared with me uh, yesterday, he was talking about and sang a, a Indian song from the Dakota uh, tradition last night at our Epiphany dinner. And it was a beautiful song about um, their traditions and about their connection to God and each other and community. And uh, maybe we'll get them in worship sometimes doing something like that and unpack it a little bit for you but the Native Americans had a deep sense of the sacred being connected to land high places strange places places that were considered holy burial places but they also did not put fences on there they saw fences as being offensive in their life because fences claimed ownership of what only God could own it made no sense to them that people own land why would you want to own land? You live on land, and land is a gift, and there's just that sense of life. It's a, it's a beautiful kind of spirituality. Where do you go for high places? Where do you go? There's a, by Lion's Tap, if mm -hmm. you go north on Spring Road, there's a spring there where you can get water. And then there's a hiking trail, and you can go all the way to the top, and you can see out to Jordan, and you can see Shakopee. And it's a similar view to what we're going to have. Sweet. behind Lion's Tap to be able to take those trails. Go on the top. Find your high place, wherever, wherever that is. And I love this, the connection, too, to think of this place. We'd love this place to be seen as one of those kinds of oasis.
where you get perspective and you get a different view of life. Jesus had a vision quest. And it wasn't about a building and it was, wasn't about Mount Sinai. It's the Mount of Transfiguration. Mount Sinai in the Old Testament lesson was about Moses climbing the mountain to bring back the Ten Commandments. Actually the Ten Commands, the words that were then unpacked into regulations, laws, and ways of living that were expansive in the Jewish tradition. They were so expansive that at times they had 511 different laws and commands enacted and if you could just do them all right you'd be a good faithful follower of the laws of Moses. And then Jesus came along and Jesus simplified the law down to basically one or two that he linked together. Love the Lord your God with heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor. He said, you don't need 511. You don't even need 10. The greatest command is this. And had this beautiful simplification of the law down to a way of life and a way of seeing your neighbor. Now we have Jesus on heading up to uh, this vision quest and he brings Peter, James, and John. James and John, the sons of thunder, they're always blurting out all sorts of goofy things. And Peter, who is always at the forefront of either challenging Jesus or testing, but also very dear to Jesus' heart. And he brings them uh, first into a situation where Jesus is praying, and we're aware that Jesus is praying, and then whether he's praying exactly at the top of the mountain or the base, we're not quite sure. <clears throat> but in the midst of his prayer experience, Elijah and Moses appear. And Elijah is one of the great prophets who represents the dreams of a broken world. How do we bring a broken world back into wholeness? How do we bring a broken and disturbed environment where people don't obey the God's law, where they don't treat each other decently, where they don't love God and love neighbor? And how do you call people back to that? That was the role of the prophets. Moses it was that law that just gave orders so that people could function and live and know the boundaries of life and there's Jesus with them. And what are they talking about? Now you gotta realize these are at different times of history. It's like what, who would you talk to if you could talk to some kind of kingpin, some anchor of your life? Would it be a grandparent? Would it be Abraham Lincoln? Would it be Martin Luther King? Would it be Martin Luther? Would it be, who would it be that you would want to sit down with and connect with to know that you live into that tradition, they've shaped you and that you carry their blessing forward? And we all carry blessings forward from our heroes, from people who were anchors in our life and had that kind of significance. So who would it be? Well, there's Jesus talking with Elijah and Moses. You'd think they'd be just about as anchor in the teachings of Jesus' life as anyone from his rabbinical studies and from his studies of scripture. And there he's with them talking about his exodus. Now this is kind of ironic because when you talk about exodus, who's the character you'd normally affiliate with that out of the three of them? Moses. Because the exodus carried them out through the Sinai Peninsula to the, the Sinai event, but then also they wandered for 40 years in circles and crazy, you know, kind of path toward the promised land. It took them so long to make that what should have been a 40-day journey at best. And so they weren't talking about Moses' exodus, they were talking about Jesus' exodus. Now you'll come to understand why this text comes right now at the start of Lent, as we go into Ash Wednesday. Because Jesus' exodus was when he turned his face towards Jerusalem and all the healing, the teaching, the casting out of demons, all the reinterpretations that he'd start to do that are rankling people. Remember going to his home congregation, they love him first and then they want to throw him off the cliff. All that kind of stuff was coming home to roost and he is heading to Jerusalem to feel the full fury of the world that can't quite deal with having the divine in their presence. Someone who reinterprets the law in this expansive, gracious, overwhelming way. 
So who's he consulting with? This is one of the great consultations in the history of our faith, and that is Jesus consulting with Moses. What's this going to be? Why? And with Elijah, the hope of the broken world. And there he is sharing the story of what's going to come. And when we look at this story now and say, why transfiguration? It was not only the endorsement, it was that Jesus is the fulfillment of that law and that healing of a broken world and that he would become the hub of a new hope, a new, not just therapy, but a new message, a new deep healing and ministering to this world that grew out of their ministries. Well, that's pretty earth-shaking. Finally, the disciples wake up. Finally, the disciples wake up and they rub their eyes and they're looking out there going, what on earth is this? Look at this. It's our Lord Jesus and it's Moses and it's Elijah and what on earth is going on here? This is amazing. It's so great. Let's take a selfie, you know. Let's put it on YouTube. Let's tweet it around the world. All my friends have got to see this. And he literally does that in his day. He says, let's build a little memorial. And, and basically what they would do is you build a memorial to something so you remember it, to remember the event. Humans always love building a memorial. That's why we love pictures. I've got thousands of pictures. I don't look at them often. But I got thousands of pictures because I got thousands of memories and I kind of crystallize those in pictures and I do remember and you know ex feel things when I look at those again but by and large you can't bring back the moment. The ones that are most powerful I've got right here in my mind and in my heart that I remember what happened to me in that experience and you carry it with you. It becomes part of who you are and part of what your journey is. But it's always been in the human experience to want to turn living faith into a dead memorial. It's been that we want to take this experience of the living God and when we experience it, mountaintop experience, a group of people, a gathering, a meal, a conversation, a prayer, a meditation, a, an experience of holiness or worship or at a, at a, a, a great... Um, revival of some sort and we want to turn it into something fixed and guaranteed and the second we try to slow it down fix it and guarantee it lock it into a credit card lock it into cash lock it into something I can repeat every week or every day the problem is living experiences don't lock up and if you try to lock them up you just end up like it ends up like a drug you end up just trying to dish more and more to feel the same way and you never feel the same way. You are a work in progress. You are a piece of clay in the hands of God, the potter. And no two days ever look the same. You are unfolding in that grace. You can't go back. Some churches are dedicated to the proposition that we have to go back either to something really traditional or to something really fixed or to some experience I had when I felt on top of the world and pastor your job is to recreate that every week or your job as a choir is to recreate that or people or however and we can't recreate anything because it was just a gift out of the hand of God and the Spirit anyway we just get together and we know God's there and good things happen and we let them unfold and they did unfold the experience of Jesus is the experience of a living God and you can't lock it in you can't freeze it when I was in high school I went to a revival went to several revivals I was trying to figure out who what does it mean to be a Lutheran a Christian <clears throat> and I went to a Dave Wilkerson revival which dates me a little bit and uh, Dave Wilkerson wrote the book The Cross and the Switchblade and it was one of the early revivals that was based on a, a ministering to gangs in New York and very brave people who came and witnessed and converted and literally kind of redeemed their life in, in a very violent place in New York. I heard the stories and I was so moved that I um, signed over my paycheck from Williams Piano Company for like $11, you know, I taught some guitar lessons 
And then I signed, I uh, came forward and I was given a card to sign. I came forward because I was moved by the event, but I was given a card that I would never sin again or never, and never wander from God. And so I'm going, what's this? This isn't Lutheran, <laughs> you know. But I was so moved, I signed it. The second I signed it, I felt like such a liar. I thought, I had just lied about this, you know. This isn't me. And how can I say that I will never be broken again? I'll never sin. I'll never leave. I said, every day I'm working on this. And it literally, Dave Wilkerson, I thank God for Dave Wilkerson, made me a Lutheran. Because at least for me and my understanding of Christianity, and Lutherans are Christians, but my understanding now is that you don't lock it up. It's not a covenant, a contract that you can write to a human being. It's living out the grace of God moment by moment and day by day as God gives you. And when somebody says, are you baptized? Um, we don't say, yeah, I was redeemed. I got it all locked up back when I was th you know, three months old and on this date and everything. We just say, yes, I'm baptized. Every day I'm living that baptism out. And some denominations get really focused on, have you had this authentic moment that converted and that made all the difference and focus on that moment. Sometimes we forget those moments and we ought to remember them. They're fun. I mean, take stock of those. When you've had those, celebrate them. They're powerful. They're good. Don't lose track of them. But you've got to live in, the, in a life that's unfolding, not a life that's a memorial. Not like Peter, you know, somehow doing selfies at the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. You want to live that out to its fullest blessing day after day. It's a living promise. Not one that you seal or lock up or contain. We want to control it. It's one that controls us. And we live it forward. In the face of this promise, the disciples had a really interesting reaction. Their most powerful reaction of the day. You know what it was? They were speechless. <laughs> they had nothing to say. Sometimes our own sense of religion has gotten so cluttered. We've got so many words for it and so many formulas and so many ways that we have figured out what the answers are to everything from suffering to life to the mysteries to whatever it is. Sometimes we are so full of our own answers we don't know how to listen to any more. And we don't know really how to listen to the voice of God anymore. You've got all sorts of people out there defending their answers in life religiously in all sorts of traditions and defending them to the death and I think there's a point where we just all need to be struck speechless in the presence of God and listen again and be able to hear again what that voice is saying to us and trying to respond to it and live it out day after day don't live just a bumper sticker faith that once and for all is just slapped somewhere to assure you know your own ego live out a living faith of God speaking to you and your decisions your relationships your choices how you choose to be the person you've been made to be by God Lord God I'm so full of my own voices at times I don't know how to hear you again and yet you need to strike me speechless so that I may hear your voice, that I may hear your call, that I may hear not only the guidance, but hear and trust in the promise that you have given deeply. They were deeply aware of God's presence at the top of the mountain. Help me to be deeply aware of your presence in the valleys in the caverns, in the, in the struggles of life, in the places where we have run aground and run adrift, where we've been broken and bruised, but never lost. In your holy name, amen.